All right, everyone, welcome to Fiveable and welcome to APGov. Um, uh, today we're going to be reviewing Unit 2, which is Interactions Among Branches of Government. As you guys have been doing already, you could go ahead and keep asking questions in the chat. There's also an Ask a Question tab um, at the bottom where you can like ask questions. And I actually prefer if you do it there because then I get notified um, with any like new questions. So um, in terms of the Fiveable Olympics, you get something like 20,000 points or something like that for watching a live stream. Um, if you're watching inside the Crowdcast window, I don't know if it'll like take it. So make sure you're watching inside Fiveable. Um, I don't know what you mean by is this a bullet point things, but we're basically going to be going through like all 15 standards that are um, in Unit 2. So Unit 2 is all the branches of government. So we're going to be doing um, all of the branches of government. And then um, we're also gonna talk about the bureaucracy. Um, can you guys hear me? All right, good. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, as always, make sure to follow Fiveable on Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, so that you can get um, everything about the live streams and updates. So I know they're doing stuff. here from North Carolina. Um, I took AP Gov as a sophomore last year. Um, and I got a five on the exam, and I'm excited about five. So, um, so let's go ahead and get started with our unit two review content. Um, the first section, which is 2.1 through 2.3, is going to be all about the legislative branch. So comparing the Senate and the House, um, a little bit more about the structure and then the powers of both of the houses. Um, 2.4 through 2.7 is going to be the executive branch. Um, everything about the president and um, a little bit more about executive agencies. Um, 2.8 through 2.11 is going to be the judicial branch. Um, that is um, everything with the courts. And then the last part is going to be about the bureaucracy, um, which is a part of the executive branch, but they have um, some specific stuff that we need to go over. So um, does anyone have any questions about content or anything like Fiveable related um, before we get started? All right, so again, throughout the stream, if you have any questions, you could ask it in the Ask the Question tab or in the chat. I'll try to check on the chat like every few seconds um, so that um, I can answer anything. So if you get nothing out of APGov, the three things that you should know are the roles of the three branches in like two words. So for the legislative branch, that is making the laws, right? So the legislative branch is addressed in Article One of the Constitution. And um, if you remember back from Unit 1, um, the Great Compromise is what they crafted in order to appeal to the large and the small states. So they initially had the New Jersey plan and the Virginia plan. New Jersey plan was um, favoring the smaller states. Virginia plan was favoring the larger states. Um, basically, what the Great Compromise did was it created a bicameral legislature. So like bi means two. So um, it's two houses within the same legislature. So the two houses are the House of Representatives and the Senate. So the House of Representatives is meant to represent the population. Um, the Senate is meant to represent uh, the states, so two per state. Um, again, specifically, it's uh, the House of Representatives is designed to favor larger states in terms of population. So the more um, people that a state has, the more representatives it has in Congress. The seats are apportioned um, every 10 years. So what that means is after the census happens, so like this year is a census year, those numbers in terms of how many representatives are allocated to each state is gonna change. So for example, my state, North Carolina, um, we recently, I think we had like an increase in population in the last 10 years and we're expected to get one new representative. Now, uh, what this means though, is that another state will lose one representative. So the House of Representatives is capped at 435, so it can't go any higher. Um, the highest number of representatives is California with 53, and then seven states have one representative. So um, remember, you can't ever go beyond 435. So if a state is gaining like five seats, then the other states are losing five seats somewhere. Okay. Um, the main thing that you should know in terms of like comparing the House versus the Senate, um, all representatives serve two-year terms, and um, they represent a small portion of the state. So they represent a congressional district, which is a obviously not the entire state, right? So if you live in the seventh congressional district of California, then your representative is only gonna be like having constituents 
in that small area, okay? Because they only represent that small portion, that means they're closer to the citizens, right? Um, in terms of a senator, they, are, uh, they represent the entire state. So let's say you're from California. California is a pretty big state, right? Um, if you have a representative that probably lives in your county, um, it's a lot easier to get access to them than your senator who represents the entire state. So that's kind of the difference between the House and the Senate. Um, again, in terms of the Senate, they are, it is designed to favor the smaller states, and each state is represented equally. So each state has two senators regardless of the population. So California and Rhode Island all have the same number of senators. Okay, so uh, if you can do some math, 2 times 50 is 100, so we have 100 senators. Um, and recall from the House, we have 435 um, voting members in the House. Um, all senators serve six-year terms, and they represent the entire state. So like I said, they're less close to their citizens because they represent the entire state. And um, a third of them are up for re-election every two years. So even though they serve six-year terms, like 33, 34 of them, are gonna be up for election um, every two years. So that way, um, the reason for that is like, let's say there was an election for all 100 senators this year in 2020, if all 100 of them get voted out in six years in 2026, now you have a whole like new group with nobody that's like, you know, senior or they don't have um, any kind of qualification yet in terms of ranking in the Senate. So that's why it's a third of them every two years to kind of stagger them out. Um, so, oh, I guess I just did that. Um, in terms of comparing the House versus the Senate, so that was kind of the main thing with this standard. Um, the size difference between the Houses of Congress influenced formality of debate. So this is like straight from College Board's wording um, in their exam description. If you think about it, like let's say you have a bigger class, like you have a class of like 35. Um, the teacher is going to be um, probably more annoyed, more stressed. Um, they're going to be a lot more formal and they're going to be uh, you know, more strict. They might not get the chance to respond to everyone, right? Um, on the other hand, um, if you have a smaller class, if you only have like 10 people, the teacher is going to be able to get to everyone and it's probably a little bit more informal, right? So just like that, the House is going to have debate that's way more formal because they have 435 members. The Senate only has 100, so the debate isn't as um, formal there. Okay, so before we move into the next standard, this is just a chart with expressed um, and implied powers. The main thing really that you should know is that anything related to money almost always comes from Congress. So borrowing money, um, coining money, um, regulating foreign commerce, regulating interstate commerce, all of that is expressed and it comes um, or it goes to Congress. Um, Congress can also declare war. So like a big misconception is that the president declares war um, Congress is the one that declares war. And then you also have some more um, social and domestic powers. These are just things that you should be aware of because they might be able to support your response. Um, yes, the slides are going to be shared at the end of the presentation. So they'll be available on the FIOVA website like as soon as I'm done. Um, so that way you can look back at everything. Okay, so that was the first standard. Um, does anyone have any questions in terms of the House versus the Senate or any of that history stuff from the beginning. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move into 2.2. We're going to talk about um, a hold and discharge petitions um, later in this stream. Um, it should be one of the next few standards. Okay, so um, the structure of the House, uh, the House is led by the Speaker of the House. So the main person in the House of Representatives is your Speaker. Um, they're the one that recognizes members to speak, so they kind of have like an authoritative, authoritative rule there. Um, and then um, they're the ones that are responsible for assigning bills to committees, etc. Some other figures that you should be aware of, um, House Majority Leader, House Minority Leader, and WHIP. So um, you'll see that there's a WHIP in both houses of Congress. All the WHIPs do really is um, round up votes. So it's not necessarily something that's like for like a senior official or anything like that but it's trying to get people of their party to vote for a bill. Um, so again, this stuff, so the majority leader, minority leader, and whip are in both houses of Congress. Um, one thing you'll, uh, you should know with the Senate is that the vice president is the official president of the Senate. So technically the president of the Senate is the vice president. However, it's really just ceremonial and 
he doesn't really do anything. Um, basically, the only thing he can do is break ties. So if there's a 50-50 vote in the Senate, um, he can break the tie. Normally, he'll go with the party um, that he's on, um, and that's how that bill will be decided. But that's pretty much all he can do. Um, in terms of the other leadership, I've already talked about, you have a majority leader, minority leader, whip, kind of serve the same roles as they do in the House. And the majority leader, the Senate majority uh, leader, is kind of like the real leader. So he's the one that actually um, does stuff. Okay, so the next thing um, in terms of this standard is the structure of the committee system. So whenever, let's say, you have a ton of stuff to do, it's a lot easier if you're able to delegate. So if you're talking about on just an individual level, making a schedule and you're like, okay, in this hour I'm going to do this, this, and this. The next hour I'm going to do this, this, and this, okay? Um, in terms of Congress, they have lots of stuff to do, lots of bills to address. Um, and that's why this committee system is there, because it's a way for Congress to make sure that these tasks that they have to get done are done efficiently. Um, so committees are present in both houses. Um, some committees that you should be aware of are standing committees. So these are the ones that you often hear of. So like the Foreign Relations Committee or the Energy Committee. Um, they're permanent, so they're always going to be there. And they're focused on specific areas of policy. Um, in terms of a select committee, they're for a specific purpose and only for a limited amount of time. Conference committee is conferencing between the House and the Senate. So let's say um, the House passes, passes one version of a bill and the Senate passes another version of the bill. Now, they kind of have to agree so that the bill can be sent to the president. Um, the conference committee helps resolve those issues and helps them come to a compromise. So those are the basics in terms of the types of committees. Um, this One of the two specific committees that you should be aware of is the House Rules Committee. This one is probably the more important one out of the two. Um, the House Rules Committee is kind of um, big in the House, and it's only in the House. So there's no Rules Committee in the Senate, um, but it helps for um, filtering uh, what bills need to be passed um, and what bills need to be considered for floor debate. Like I said, there's 435 members in the House. It's hard to regulate. So like I said before, um, this stuff is a lot more formal in the House. and That's why there is a House Rules Committee, and there's not a Senate Rules Committee. And then two terms that you should be aware of in terms of um, the rule, whether it's strict or not, is closed rule and open rule. Closed rule is a lot stricter. That's basically when there's a time limit on how long that bill can be debated. Um, amendments aren't allowed, things like that. Open rule is kind of the opposite. Um, so there's not really a set time limit. Um, there may be opportunities for amendments. Um, but those are two things that you should be aware of that the House Rules Committee can kind of assign. Now, a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about is very specific. Um, I don't think they're going to be very specific on the AP exam because what they're saying is that um, they want to make sure that if you look up stuff, then um, like you won't just directly get the answer. So I don't think they'll be like, okay, what does the House Rules Committee do? Because you can easily Google that and find it. Um, however, I mean, I don't know, like they could. Um, with the argumentative essay, obviously they're not going to ask, like, you know, which one is better, closed rule or open rule. But all of these terms, um, they're good to be aware of because you might need to use them on the AP exam, let's say, um, in terms of concept application. Also, what College Board has said is that um, all of the materials, so even the units that aren't covered, are necessary um, to get the levels for um, college entrance exams, things like that. So you really should be aware of everything in the course, not just units one through three or just like what you think is the important stuff. So continuing on with 2.2, I said before there's going to be two committees that College Board emphasizes they want you to know. Um, this one's kind of weird because honestly, I'd never heard of it before taking this class. So the Committee of the Whole is unique only to the House, and it's not required for members to participate in. The rules are more relaxed, and it's basically when um, bills can be voted on as a group. Again probably don't need to know it for the AP exam, but just some context um, to have there. Okay, so does anyone have any questions in terms of the committee system? Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna talk about is how a bill becomes a law. So you probably heard the Schoolhouse Rock song and you know stuff like that. And honestly, it provides a pretty good overview of what you need to know um, for how a bill becomes law. But obviously it's a lot more detailed and the process is more intricate. 
So one thing that you should remember is structure impacts function. So this standard is titled structures, powers, and functions. These two, the structures and powers, impact how Congress can function. So any legislator can in introduce a bill and they can get the idea for a bill from themselves, from their constituents, from other legislators, anything, okay? But they have to be a legislator in order to introduce the bill. The bill is then sent to a standing committee so that's like foreign relations or energy. And then the committee assigns it to a specific subcommittee. So your committee is gonna be people that are in leadership and they probably know or are experts in, let's say foreign relations. But let's say this specific bill is addressing Asian policy. And there's probably a subcommittee that deals with specifically Asian foreign policy, okay? So those people are probably even more um, or have even more expertise specifically in Asian foreign policy, which is why it's being sent there. Um, only about 3% of bills that are introduced by legislators actually become law. So a lot of times in committee, bills are often pigeonholed. So pigeonholed is a kind of like a slang word that you might hear. Basically, all this means is that the um, bill is ignored and they kind of just keep it in committee. So they never actually talk about it in committee. Um, there's something called a discharge petition, which is basically um, an easy way to get it out of committee quickly. Um, once it gets out of committee and then it goes to the full chamber, so let's say it was um, introduced in the House, it goes to the House Foreign Relations Committee, uh, it then goes to the subcommittee on Asian policy or whatever, um, based on whatever it's about, um, and it doesn't get pigeonholed, so it goes to the uh, full chamber. The entire House of Representatives is going to vote on it. Let's say it passes, it then goes to the other House, which is, which in this case would be the Senate. They have to pass the exact same bill, and if they pass the exact same bill, then it goes to the President's desk. Um, so some special Senate functions, so things that the um, House of Representatives cannot do, um, is a filibuster. So a filibuster is basically when you talk a bill to death. So like legislators can give long speeches and kind of just talk and talk and talk until they feel like people will just give up and they'll be like, okay, we don't care about the bill. Um, so an example of this, if you look up Ted Cruz um, reading Green Eggs and Ham, he tried to filibuster a bill and that's what he did. So yeah, there are some great videos on this about just um, these congressmen, congresswomen doing crazy things um, to filibuster. Um, in order to stop a filibuster, there has to be a cloture, basically it's just a movement um, to stop the filibuster. Um, like I talked about before, if a different version of the same bill is passed in the second house, so let's say house passes version A on this Asian foreign policy bill, and then um, in the Senate, they tweak one little thing, that's not okay. Um, it can't just be sent to the president's desk. That's when a conference committee is created so that they can conference and then compromise. So then they come up with one version of the bill that can then be passed through the house and the Senate, and then it goes to the president's desk. And um, after the, it goes to the president's desk, he has some opportunities to either sign it or veto it. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the weird ones like pocket veto um, in just a few minutes. So um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of structures, powers, and functions is spending. So this kind of goes with policy. Um, in terms of federal spending, um, there's a few types. First type is discretionary spending. Discretionary spending basically means that program is not required by law. Um, the largest portion of this is defense. So military aid, stuff like that, the largest portion of any discretionary spending is defense. Um, highways, agriculture, those are all things that are discretionary spending, okay? Um, mandatory spending means it's required by law. So things like healthcare programs. Um, Social Security, all of those are required by law, so Congress has to um, uh, guarantee that. In terms of this being tested um, last year, I think policy was actually tested um, on the concept base a little bit, and then the quantitative a little bit, and then the argumentative essay a little bit. Um, I don't know how they're going to test policy this year, um, but I'm sure they have to find a way to integrate it since it is a big part of the course. Um, what I think will happen is that they're going to test civil rights and stuff in one FRQ, um, test this unit, so um, interactions among branches in government in one unit, and then kind of spread that history stuff between both. Because your history stuff in terms of the foundations of American democracy, which is unit one, 
Um, that's going to be the stuff that um, is going to be tested on your argumentative essay because you have to provide evidence from those foundational documents. So again, that's just my guess, but you know, no one knows what will happen. Mandates are basically kind of, but not really. Mandates are when the federal government mandates the states to do something that really deals more with federalism so if you watch the stream from two weeks ago um, there's more information on that but in terms of mandates and then like uh like the different types of grants so like block grants um, what states like what states don't like that's where mandates kind of falls in it doesn't really go with the concept of mandatory and discretionary spending right this is federal spending not state spending so this section is talking about congress so um, this is all about um, federal spending. Um, I think all of the federalism and state stuff under Unit 1, which is Foundations of American Democracy, because federalism is one of the um, principles of American democracy. OK, so that was more of 2.2. Some weird kind of words to know um, that you might hear are pork barrel projects and log rolling. Pork barrel projects are bills that are catered specifically towards a representative's district. This means that that project is only going to bring in money to that member's district. So um, it's going to benefit a very small portion of the country. So this could kind of, this normally goes with House, like in the House, but it can also go with the Senate if it's only going to benefit like that one state. Um, pork barrel projects are kind of looked down upon, but they're looked up upon by the people in that state because it's going to benefit them, it might create new jobs, et cetera. Um, log rolling is basically when like one member of Congress is like, you support my bill, I'll support yours. So it's kind of like that exchange so that they can build support. So this kind of stuff um, might happen with um, uh, members of opposite parties so that um, they can get their bills passed, especially if it's going to be um, a vote. Um, could poor barrel projects be something like fixing Flint Waters crisis? I mean, technically, I guess yes, but um, you know, I would hope that the country you know, feels more strongly about something like dangerous water. Um, really, pork barrel projects is kind of a general term, um, and it's normally used with a negative connotation. So, um, yes, probably, like theoretically, fixing Flint's water crisis is only going to help Flint, but um, you probably wouldn't use the term pork barrel project with that because it kind of has a negative vibe. Okay. So that was all of 2.2, .2, so that was a lot. Does anyone have any other questions on that standard? So that one was probably one of the bigger standards. You'll see a lot of these things, they break it down so like into such small standards, like one of them is like two sentences. Um, but that's what College Board does. So um, 2.3 is gonna be congressional behavior. Um, and this is firstly going to talk about ideological division. So the concept of divided government, what that is, is that different parties hold majorities in the House of the Congress. So for example, the Democrats might control the House and the Republicans might control the Senate. Um, another definition for divided government is when one party controls Congress and another party controls the presidency. So right now you see divided government in terms of this, where um, different parties hold majorities in the Houses of Congress. Um, this can be good and bad. Does anyone have any examples of why this could be good? Because we can probably think of lots of examples of why this could be bad, but does anyone know why this could be good? Right, compromise. So compromise is a big thing, um, not only in terms of um, the federal government, but also federal and state relationships. But right, every, um, everything you guys said was right. So passing more laws, um, sometimes it actually restricts um, the passage of more laws, but it does help for um, people to be able to hear both sides. Um, yes, it kind of checks one party's power, um, stops one party from being too powerful, all-inclusive perspectives, and the bills passed must be very important, right? So if it's able to go through all of those steps and be able to um, be agreed on by Democrats and Republicans, and it's probably important and it probably needs to be addressed. Obviously, some disadvantages means that it could take such a long time for bills to actually go through and make it through this entire process. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the bad thing with this. However, the good thing, obviously, like you guys said, is compromise. Okay. 
So this next slide is going to talk about gerrymandering. Does anyone know what gerrymandering is, who it's done by, any court cases that relate to gerrymandering? Yes, redrawing district lines. And who draws those district lines? Right, states. So the federal government does not um, do gerrymandering or do stuff like that. But the states do. So we talked about earlier that in the House of Representatives, um, the representation is based on population. And that uh, the number of representatives changes every 10 years um, based on the census, right? So more people move in, more people move out. Um, so that process is called reapportionment. Like I said earlier, this um, piece of legislation, the Reapportionment Act, capped the size of the House at 435 members. So it's not like you could just have one state gaining a ton of representatives and now we have like 500 okay so each member of the house represents one district this means that there's a total of 435 districts in the entire country um, after reapportionment for example california was given 53 representatives what this means is that it's up to that state so it's up to california to draw those 53 53 districts so like technically if they wanted they could make one huge district and then 52 tiny districts that are like one mile by one mile now that's where this concept of gerrymandering and controversial redistricting comes in, right? So each of those 53 districts have one representative. Um, the terms, the term gerrymandering means the state legislature, um, whoever controls the state legislature at that time, redraws congressional districts to favor its party. So it could happen by the Democrats or it could happen by the Republicans. So for example, um, my state, North Carolina, the a gerrymandering case has gone to court um, the Supreme Court because Republicans did it and because Democrats did it. So it could go both ways and really it's just luck in terms of who is there um, within those um, 10 years. Okay, so someone asked a question, can you go over cloture? So I answered that a little bit earlier, but it's basically a motion by senators to stop the um, filibuster that's happening. And right, so we're going to talk about Shake or Shaw versus Greeno and Baker versus Carr. Um, yes. Okay. So the first case that we're going to talk about is Baker versus Carr. Um, the formatting is kind of off because I copied it um, from one of the guides that are that I wrote in uh, five of them. So um, another question: How long does it take to gerrymander? Well, it happens during those census years. So after the census comes out. And then, um, you know, each state is assigned how many of our representatives are going to be assigned to that state. That's when gerrymandering could occur. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is Baker versus Carr. Um, some context, this guy named Charles Baker stated that old law, which was um, in Tennessee, um, it detailed apportionment for the General Assembly and it had been ignored. Um, and he stated that the reapportionment didn't really take into account the significant change that the state had been through. So um, this case was unique because it really was dealing with, can the Supreme Court hear a case like this? Because the um, legislative branch at the state level is the one that's doing the redistricting. Um, the Chief Justice and the Supreme Court, so majority opinion, concluded that because of 14th Amendment issues, so equal protection, the Supreme Court does have the ability to hear that case. So basically, if it's unfairly drawn, that goes against that equal protection clause, and that's why the court could hear it. Um, in terms of the impact that this had, it had um, it allowed for more challenges to this unfair redistricting by way of the equal protection clause. Eventually, it leads to this one person, one vote thing, which we're going to talk about with Shaw versus Reno. So I think someone said in the chat, um, Katie, so Shaw versus Reno, the S stands for snakes, and snakes are not allowed if it's only based on race. So yes, that's a um, good acronym or initialism for you to use. So um, Shaw versus Reno, so um, this happened in North Carolina, um, and several residents challenged an unusually shaped district. So they believed that the only purpose of the district was that it would um, definitely elect an African-American representative. So that's a way that it had been drawn. Um, so that basically there was a guarantee that an African-American representative would be appointed. Now the constitutional issue here was whether racial gerrymandering first, if that took place, and if this was like allowed, and did it raise an equal protection clause issue. Now what the um, Supreme Court held was that um, 
because the district was shaped so oddly, like it was definitely shaped weird, um, it was odd enough to prove that there was an obvious effort um, and race was like the main factor here. So um, again, a key fact about this case is that majority minority districts, what this means is that um, like most of the population in that district is of a minority ethnicity. Um, those districts can be constitutionally challenged if race is the only factor that's used in their creation. Right? So that's kind of a short summary of Shaw versus Reno. Okay, so the last thing I think uh, in terms of 2.3 and congressional behavior is um, constituent accountability. So there's three models um, that representatives can follow um, when they are acting in Congress. So does anyone know what, what any of those three models are? So, um, yeah, does anyone know them? Right, delegate is one, trustee is another, and then there's one more, and politico. So politico is kind of a combination of the um, delegate and trustee. So the delegate model is basically when the legislators vote as a delegate of the people. So whatever the constituents want, um, that's what they do. So they vote um, whatever the people want, okay? Whatever, whoever they're representing, whoever they are representing want, okay? The other thing or other model is a trustee model. This is when legislators are trusted by their constituents to vote for the better. So um, it's kind of like the um, legislators making a decision based on their judgment. Um, Politico is using both. So using both whenever they think that um, one is appropriate. So if they think um, delegate is appropriate for this bill, then they would use that delegate model. Um, obviously this, I mean, I doubt they think about, it. they're like, okay, which model am I using? But this is just kind of a way to describe that political um, process or whatever you want to call it. Okay, so that's everything about the legislative branch that you need to know. Um, does anyone have any questions in terms of the legislative branch? Um, someone asked about a hold earlier. What a hold is, is that um, basically a senator can try to prevent a motion from reaching the floor. So like going up for debate, that's what a hold is. So that kind of goes with the stuff about discharge petition, like that group of terms. Okay, so if no one has any questions on the um, legislative branch, we're gonna move into the executive branch. Um, as you guys probably know, um, the executive branch is mostly about the president. Um, the executive branch, again, one of those um, things that I talked about earlier, if you don't get anything out of this unit, you should know that the executive branch, their main role in two words is that they enforce the laws, okay? So they're described in Article 2 of the Constitution, um, and it's not as specific in terms of what powers the branch has. Um, it's not as specific as Article 1 in the legislative branch, but it's still stuff that you should be aware of and kind of like go by, you know? So the first thing that I want to talk about is the veto power and what the president can do when a bill reaches his desk, okay? So um, the first thing that they can do is easy. They sign the bill into law within 10 days. So if it happens within 10 days, um, they can sign it into law and it's law. Okay, done. The second thing is that they can veto a bill. When a bill is vetoed, um, it's sent back to Congress and Congress can override the veto with two thirds majority in both houses. It's very unlikely that a veto um, is overridden. It barely ever happens Okay, because it requires such a large majority from both houses. The third thing is, let's say the president does not sign a bill um, and Congress is still in session. The bill becomes a law, okay? So what I mean by um, Congress still in session is let's say, um, like I don't know the specifics, but let's say Congress goes out for Christmas on December the, um, I don't know, December the 15th, okay? Let's say um, uh, the bill is sent to the president's desk on December the 4th, okay? Um, if it's sent to the president's desk on December the 4th and he doesn't sign it until December 14th, on December 14th, the bill, will, the bill will become a law without the president's signature. So it will become a law, okay? The other way, so like let's say Congress is not in session. So um, the bill is passed on, let's say, um, December 10th and the Congress leaves on December 15th, right? So if the president just doesn't sign it for 10 days, now that 10 day period ends on December 20th and Congress is not in session, right? So the um, bill is vetoed. I'm not sure about um, if, I, 
I'm honestly not sure about the difference really with a pocket veto if that does happen. And yes, it's called a pocket veto. So I would recommend you look that up because honestly, I don't know um, if recess is considered being in session or not. Um, so probably the Christmas example I used probably wasn't the best, but it's really just to show you like if Congress is still working, then then it will become law. If they're not working, then, then it will be vetoed. Okay, so the next thing about the executive branch, kind of short and again, kind of weird, is a signing statement. So again, this is something that you probably might not even have heard of in your AP Gov class just because it's such a small concept. It's just a way that the president can exert influence over a law. Let's just say if he doesn't agree with part of it, um, he can't change the law, but he can give his opinion, okay? So they can give their opinion on the law and his or her interpretation. And it tells the executive branch, so we'll talk about later, the bureaucratic agencies. So they're the ones that actually enforce the law. It tells them how to enforce the law. So it kind of gives a little bit of the president's input in terms of what they think of the law and how to enforce it. So this is not like it's required on every law. It doesn't have to be there, but it is something that um, College Board says that you might need to know for the exam. Okay. Um, Again, more in terms of the president, they have a lot of foreign policy powers. So I kind of already put on their commander in chief, but does anyone else know any of the other roles that the president occupies in terms of foreign policy? Um, is the signing statement something that people listen to, like the public? I mean, not really, um, but the bureaucratic agencies, maybe, um, in terms of how they were going to actually enforce the law. So yes, chief diplomat, chief not really chief legislator because they're not a part of the part of the legislative branch but yes they do they are the last kind of person in that bill to a law process um yes treaties so treaties and ambassadors those have to be approved by the senate um executive agreements do not have to be so we're going to talk about that right so negotiate treaties can form executive agreement right all of those are correct all right, so um, they are commander in chief of the military, but one thing again, like I pointed out earlier, the Congress Congress is the one that declares war. So the president does not declare war. That's Congress's job. Okay, um, the War Powers Act. So that's a piece of legislation that you probably studied in your AP Gov class. Um, it aims to give more power to the legislative branch because what's happened in the past is that troops were sent into armed conflict, and it wasn't really a declaration of war. However, it, pretty much was a war. So Korean War, Vietnam War, those are all examples. Okay, so um, there must be, under the War Powers Act, there must be notification by the president to the legislative branch within 48 hours of deploying any troops. So if they don't want to declare, well, they can't declare war, but let's say they want to send troops, they have to tell Congress within 48 hours and they can have, um, the troops can be there for 60 days before they have to be withdrawn if there's no declaration of war passed. Remember that money to fund the war still comes from Congress. So let's say um, you know, troops are sent, the equipment and stuff like that, funding the military is still done by Congress, okay? And um, Jose, we're gonna talk about the difference between executive agreement and a treaty in just a moment. All right, so like you guys said, um, the president acts under the role of a chief diplomat. So he or she appoints ambassadors with Senate confirmation um, he or she receives ambassadors, recognizes nations, um, hosts state visits to improve foreign relations. So all these things are under the role of chief diplomat by the president. So um, in terms of the difference between treaties and executive agreements, treaties are formal and only the president can negotiate them. And they have to be confirmed by the Senate with a two thirds majority. On the other hand, executive agreements are way more informal. So they might just be like talking about them with the leader of another country, and it doesn't have to be approved by the Senate. This means that it's not formal law, so it's not legal, and it's not binding from like president to president. So it might be custom, like they might follow it, but it's not binding. So let's say um, we get a new president, then the new president doesn't necessarily have to follow the executive agreement because it was not confirmed by the Senate. So um, it's kind of a way almost for the president to get around that check of treaties needing to be confirmed by the um, Senate. Yes, um, executive agreement is an informal power and does not require Senate confirmation. All right, so the next thing that we're going to talk about with roles and powers of the president is an executive order. 
So it's part of the president's implied powers, which means it's not directly stated in the Constitution. However, um, it has kind of been implied by the powers that already are there in the Constitution. Um, executive orders might allow for the management of federal government, and it gives more authority really to the president. The president has more say. It does not have to be approved by Congress, and it might lead to conflict with Congress and the agenda. So a lot of times, um, if a president passes executive orders, so we've seen um, several controversial ones from our current president, a lot of times it's regarded as an overreach of power. Um, again, that just normally just depends on the party that's in Congress and the party of the president. So if you have divided government and um, the president issues an executive order, normally that's going to spark outrage from Congress. Let's say they're both of the same party. Normally it's not. So again, it's all really partisan at this point, especially in our day and age. Um, but yeah. Okay, so that was all with the last standard, 2.4. Does anyone have any questions about that? So the roles and the powers. Executive order is basically like um, a mandate that um, everyone really, I guess the federal agencies and things they have to um, abide by. Agenda setting, um, we will talk about that later in this stream, I'm pretty sure. Um, and agenda setting also goes with presidential communication, with it, which is like its own separate standard. And that's one of the ones I talked about. It's like two sentences, so I don't know why they made it its own standard, but that's okay. Okay, so in terms of 2.5 and checks on the presidency. Um, right, so mandates um, are issued by the federal government, and that's more in terms of federalism, okay, and um, issuing mandates to the state government. Um, a mandate and executive order are not the same thing. Um, and Ashley, you're right. So that's one of the things he did with his executive orders. Okay, so um, in terms of checks on the presidency, we've already really talked about a lot of them. So most of this is review. But the president has the power to appoint people, including his cabinet members. So that's like Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, um, Secretary of Energy, and then the Attorney General is also part of the cabinet. Um, any ambassadors to other countries. So they kind of serve as representing uh, rep representing the United States somewhere else, um, and then judges. So all of those require Senate confirmation. Um, one thing that you should remember, which I think is interesting, is that the cabinet head um, has loyalty more towards their own department. So let's say we have the attorney general. They're going to have more loyalty towards the um, Department of Justice than the like entire like presidency or like the entire um, administration. Okay, so the cabinet is influential. However, they're not as influential as the White House staff who um, they don't need to be appointed. And they're normally a lot more in line with the president and probably agree with the president on almost everything. The cabinet, cabinet heads, on the other hand, probably do agree with the president. However, um, their loyalty is more towards their own department. So if you have the Secretary of Energy, he's going to be, um, he or she is going to be more concerned um, with energy-related policy or energy-related um, legislation um, when compared to the education secretary who's going to be more um, involved with education legislation. Okay, and like I talked about, White House staff, they don't need to be confirmed and they are much closer to the president. Um, one thing that you should know is that the president's lasting influence um, comes from judicial appointments. Um, so if they appoint someone to any federal court position, they're basically going to be there for the rest of their life under good behavior. Okay, um, do you think we'll have a president's emergency powers on the exam? What do you mean by like emergency powers? Like War Powers Act, that kind of thing, or like now with coronavirus? Um, probably not, because I think um, they want it. The point of this AP test is that they're trying to test the entire like um, course, so all three units within two FRQs. So I probably not, I'm assuming. Um, they're probably not going to focus on stuff that's super specific. One, because you can look it up and it's easy for you to do that. Two, because um, they need to make sure they're testing the entire content. So if they have like two parts of a question focusing on just crisis management, then that's like taking away from questions that they could ask about a unit that's not covered. So probably not, but you can never put anything past them really, I guess. Um, the next standard is expansion of presidential power. So does anyone have questions about 2.5? Right. So yes, real life examples can always support your um, claim if they're correct. Like they could um, definitely enhance your response. 
Does anyone have any questions in terms of checks and balances with the president or the executive branch? All right, so we're going to go ahead and move into 2.6, which is expansion of presidential power. So this one is pretty short, but one document that you should be aware of is Federalist Number 70. Uh, Federalist num Number 70 kind of advocates for a strong single executive. One thing that I would do um, with um, your foundational document is try and read like an abridged or a translated version, so one that you're better able to comprehend before the exam and kind of take notes on them. If you go back to a Q&A stream I did probably the beginning of April, um, I went through the foundational document. So if you want to watch that, that might be helpful. Just try and make something as reference so that you can, like, let's say they say, okay, you have to use Federal 70. You can quickly look at your notes on Federal 70 about important quotes, stuff like that. Right, making a list of uh, main arguments. They're all going to be good for that argumentative essay. Okay. Um, the Federal 70 is normally used as justification for increased powers to the executive branch because it talked about that strong single ex um, executive. Um, another thing that deals with the expansion of power is a 22nd Amendment, um, which says that you can only have two terms in office. So FDR had four, which is why now they say two. Um, there's also several historical events that can demonstrate the expansion of presidential power. So if you've taken any kind of like U.S. history class, so like a push, um, IB history, anything. Um, one example would be the Civil War. So President Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. So that's one thing that at the time was regarded as an overreach of power. Um, and you'll see a lot of that when the president, you know, expands their power or goes to expand their power. Um, the New Deal is um, something that also can be looked at. So Roosevelt's programs kind of restructure the economy, um, implementation of welfare programs. So all of that is important. Um, is the 22nd Amendment an expansion more than a limit? Well, really it's a limit on two terms, like you can only serve two terms, but it comes under expansion because it was like as a reaction to possible expansion of power. So because this president served for four terms, the 22nd Amendment was more like a limit on that expansion, if that makes sense. 2.7 is a pretty easy standard. Um, it's going to be talking about modern technology. So the use of social media means a more rapid response to political issues, both in terms of the president reacting and the public reacting. So like, um, for example, the current president uses Twitter. So um, he uses Twitter to kind of get his um, message across, I guess. Um, yeah. So he, yes, you, they use social media. Um, the other thing is that um, with increased modern technology, there is quicker response from the public in terms of like, like approval. So we'll always see polls like every day about approval rating of so-and-so president is so is blank, okay? Um, 50%, 60%, 10%. Um, different polls, different organizations, that kind of goes into the politics stuff in terms of media and possible bias, okay? These ratings fluctuate. So one thing you want to remember is that for any president, regardless of um, party, um, at the beginning of their presidency, they're probably going to have one of the highest approval ratings of their presidency. Okay. The other thing, times of crisis. So for example, 9-11, um, George W. Bush's um, approval uh, rating was somewhere around 90%. Okay. Like the days after 9-11, um, that was his approval rating. So in terms of uh, Republicans and Democrats. Okay. So for example, the coronavirus uh, pandemic, right? This is a time of crisis for our country. So um, the president's approval ratings are naturally going to be higher because um, they always see the president trying to address the crisis, right? So, um, for example, he's always at these press briefings. He can get access to media. So his approval rating is going to improve. Economic growth is also going to um, uh, cause a higher approval rating. Um, in the beginning of the president's term, they pass more laws. Um, well, they're not really passing the laws. They might try and get laws passed. Um, but yeah, well, right now, actually, Trump's approval rating is a lot higher than um, it was before. However, you know, the way in which it's being depicted by his administration is that it's higher because of his actions. But normally, just one thing to keep in mind, again, not taking aside politics or anything, but one thing to keep in mind is that any time of crisis, approval rating is going to go up for the president, regardless of whether Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green, always times of crisis means increased approval rating because people see that um, he's doing something. And yes, we're going to talk about bully pulpit um, on this next slide. 
So um, the president has the ability to be on TV and other media platforms in an instant, right? They could do that. They could get on TV at any time. So a, a key example of this is going to be the State of the Union. Um, it's a way for them to promote their agenda, agenda setting. That comes in with bully pulpit. Okay. Um, one thing in terms of the president being able to get on TV at any time, you can see that right now in the 2020 election. So um, pres the current president, so President Trump, he has easier access to media because he's a president. So like he can get on TV whenever he wants. However, um, former Vice President Biden, who's now basically the presumptive Democratic nominee, he's having a tougher time um, getting, um, uh, what's it called, media coverage because um, everyone's kind of focusing, first of all, on the president and this time of crisis, right? So that's kind of um, what you'll see is that there could be um, possible impact on his campaign um, because he's not getting as much media coverage. Before this coronavirus stuff, that was the main topic of the news cycle. Now it's shifted almost completely towards this, so we don't even really hear about the election this month. Um, in terms of the incumbent advantage, uh, yes, in terms of the incumbent right now has the advantage, but incumbent advantage normally refers more to um, legislators. So like let's say a senator is up for re-election, they're going to get a lot more um, money, funding, media coverage, um, as opposed to whoever's running against them that's not the incumbent. This also does apply to income advantage, especially right now. Um, but yeah, income advantage normally goes with the legislative branch. Okay, so 2.8 is gonna be um, the judicial branch. So this is our last branch of government. Does anyone have any questions so far in terms of um, legislative branch or executive branch? This is probably gonna go over time, but um, the next few standards are not too long. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move into the um, judicial branch. So the judicial branch, like I've been saying, with the two words that you need to know for each branch, they interpret the law. Okay, so if you get nothing out of the judicial branch, you should know that they interpret the law. Um, the Judiciary Act of 1789 is what established the federal court system. Um, as you guys know, the Supreme Court is the highest court in the United States, and it's the only one specified in the Constitution. Um, this stuff, I'm going to go. Um, if your hand hurts from writing notes, always remember that this replay is going to be up like two hours after this stream. So it's okay if you want to take a break. But um, yeah. Uh, in terms of the judicial branch, um, this is kind of a chart with the three levels. Um, the lowest level is going to be your district courts. So the people that are making the decision there is a jury. There's then 12 courts of appeal, um, and then three judges decide that. Then you have um, nine justices on the Supreme Court. This stuff really probably won't be tested. You should know stuff about the judicial branch, but the federal court system structure is like a tiny standard in the entire thing. So this is just stuff that's, again, context. So there's 91 federal courts of original jurisdiction. We're going to talk a little bit more about what that term means in just a few minutes. Um, in terms of federal courts, um, district courts can have 2 to 28 judges. Um, and they're the only federal courts to have juries. Um, their jurisdiction, which is basically what cases can they hear, extends to federal crimes or civil suits under federal law. Okay. The next kind of court system or branch, I guess, part of the federal court system is going to be your 11 judicial circuits. So really, it's almost like 13, but you have 11 and then you have your D.C. circuit and then you have your federal circuit. So each one serves at least two states. Um, and there's normally panels of three judges. The main thing you should know with this part is that they're focused on correcting errors of procedure and law, not like is he guilty or is he not guilty? Okay, so this is more in terms of constitutionality. And did they maybe like, for example, did they not um, give him, um, I don't know, like a Miranda warning before? Or did they not, like, did he not get a fair trial? Um, or did he not get a speedy trial? Okay. Um, Appellate courts um, means that um, they hear cases, so they don't, like, this is never the place where a case first comes up. So, no, they don't have any original jurisdiction. Your original jurisdiction after the district court is going to go up to a Supreme Court where they hear, like, state versus state. Okay, so um, the next thing, so Supreme Court, this is supposed to say Supreme Court up here. We're going to change it to the standard. Um, but the Supreme Court is the highest court of the land. They have original and appellate jurisdiction. 
So appellate jurisdiction, their stuff comes from the state Supreme Court and the federal circuit courts. Um, they control their own agenda, so the justices decide. It's very unlikely you're going to get your case all the way up to the Supreme Court. You have to file what's called a writ of certiorari. Uh, if you've watched a documentary about Gideon versus Wainwright, like I remember watching that in civics. Um, that's something that um, you might know. Okay. Um, again, the main power of the judicial branch is judicial review. So Federal 78 addresses this power and talking about how the judicial branch can protect the abuse of power by Congress. Um, it reviews the actions of other branches and can declare them unconstitutional. And this is almost the most major check that this branch has on the others. Okay. They can declare the other the actions of the other branches unconstitutional. Your main case that you want to focus on here is Marbury versus Madison. Marbury versus Madison. Um, again, if you've taken like an APOS class or something like that, Hoda, you've probably heard of this before. Um, but it's basically um, you can read the summary. So the 1800 election ended in a defeat for Adams um, to Thomas Jefferson. However, before Adams' term ended, um, Congress. First, they passed this Judiciary Act. So they created new courts, added new judges. Um, basically, this whole process was a way for John Adams to keep his own influence. So remember, um, judges serve for life. Um, this is a way in which his influence could be retained because even after he leaves the presidency, um, the justices or judges on the courts are still going to be um, there. Okay. So he made a ton of appointments to these courts. So. Um, Yes. However, they were not valid until the appointed judges were delivered their commissions. However, this commission was delivered by Jefferson, uh, Secretary of the State. However, Marbury, who was one of the judges appointed by um, Adams, didn't have his commission delivered. So obviously he was mad because he thought he was going to be a judge, right? Um, the key issue here is whether, first of all, the court had the authority to order the delivery of the commission. So could they say you have to give Marbury that commission? And second of all, uh, can a federal judge even bring a case to court like this? Okay, so the court held that although legally the commission should have been delivered, um, the Judiciary Act of 1789, which enabled Marbury to bring the case to court, itself was unconstitutional. So really, like this whole situation in the background almost doesn't relate to the ruling of the case and where we get judicial review from, because judicial review is coming from this case. And the reason why is because they declared this clause of, um, of the Judiciary Act of 1789 unconstitutional. So they declared a part of legislation, which is from the legislative branch, unconstitutional. So that's what is called judicial review. Okay. Um, the next standard, so I'm going to move into 2.9, and then I'll um, address any questions, um, is going to be talking about the legitimacy of the judicial branch. So I saw some of you guys putting in the chat talking about precedent and stare decisis. Stare decisis is a term which means to let the decision stand. Most Supreme Court cases are um, decided based on this concept. Um, however, it doesn't always have to be followed. Okay, so basically what this means is that previous cases and rulings are used to guide future rulings. So does anyone know an example of a case um, where stare decisis or precedent was overturned? Article three is going to talk about like the court system, so it established the Supreme Court, etc. Right, um, Brown versus Board, and um, Brown versus Board. Uh, what did it reverse? Right, Plessy versus Ferguson. Okay, so that's one case where stare decisis was not followed, um, and it's basically a change in the interpretation of the law by Congress, or not by Congress, by the Supreme Court. Okay, um, one thing that is also included in this is the confirmation process. One thing you should know about really the word legitimacy is that you're trying to protect the integrity of this branch, which is why, first of all, they serve for life, um, because if they serve for life, they're free from any political pressures, and if they're going like, to lose their job, if they make the wrong decision. Um, precedent, okay, this is wrong. I don't know why that says that, but precedents, Pre presidents appoint federal judges. They're not appointed by federal judges. Um, but federal judges must be confirmed by the Senate. Um, the Supreme Court, like let's say um, the president appoints someone to the Supreme Court, um, a full background check has to be conducted by the FBI. No, precedent and stare decisis are the same thing. Um, 
So stare decisis means let the decision stand, which is precedent. So whatever decision was made earlier, that stands. Um, in terms of um, Brown versus Board, they did not go with precedent. So they um, decided to reverse what they did before. So um, in Plessy versus Ferguson, they were like, um, you can have it. Uh, separate facilities as long as they're equal. Um, in Brown versus Board of Education, they said separate can never be equal. So in that case, they reversed precedent or did not go with precedent. Now, if let's say a similar case comes up, they're going to look at the Brown versus Board of Education case. They're they're not. I I thought I clarified that just a minute ago. But presidents presidents are not appointed by federal judges. Um, yes, federal um, judges are appointed by presidents. Hopefully that makes sense. That was a mistake on my part. It should just say really here, pres presidents appoint federal judges. Um, and yes, nomination, and then, I mean, nomination, selection, like confirmation, and then it's called an appointment. So they're called judicial appointments. Judicial nomination is like the process of saying, okay, this is the guy that I want to put on the Supreme Court. So it's kind of like that first step. Second step is gonna be the Senate saying, okay, yes, two thirds. Um, and then third is going to be um, the actual like appointment to the Supreme Court. So he's been formally appointed. Um, the Senate, so if you're appointing a Supreme Court justice, they do a complete background check. Um, the FBI does that. The Senate Judiciary Committee hold these grueling confirmation hearings. The entire Senate votes. Um, presidents appoint judges that share ideological values. So yeah, like, I mean, we'd like to think that ideology doesn't matter when picking a justice, but it obviously does because um, that's kind of the president's legacy. And that's what um, they're going to, um, I guess, that's what they're going to abide by. Um, and that's what everyone's going to remember them by. So um, 30 years from now, uh, Merrick Garland and Brett Kavanaugh are going to be Trump's legacy. Like there's, they probably, or they could be still on the Supreme Court. Okay. And like I said, justices are for life. So does anyone have any questions in terms of anything we've talked about with the judicial branch so far? Um, the Judiciary Act, of, the part that was unconstitutional was allowing that judge to even bring that case to court. So it was something in terms of him bringing it to court. Um, and it was, what was reversed was that clause in the, whatever the law was. So it really didn't have anything to do with Marbury not getting his commission. So it kind of ended up bad for Marbury. Okay, so in terms of the types of jurisdiction, um, we talked about this earlier already. But original jurisdiction is when a court hears a case for the first time. Okay, so they're the original people that hear it. Appellate jurisdiction is when a court hears a case as an appeal. So um, let's say the Supreme Court, they're hearing a case from the state Supreme Court, right? So they're hearing it as an appeal because let's say the state Supreme Court found the guy, um, or let's say the state Supreme Court, the guy didn't get a, I don't know, a free trial or a fair trial. Um, the decision could be appealed to the Supreme Court, a writ of certiorari could be filed, and then that's when the court would hear it. Exclusive jurisdiction is kind of the weird one. Um, it's basically when a case can only be heard by a specific court. So for example, conflict between states. So if North Carolina sues South Carolina, um, that can only be heard by the Supreme Court. So no other court can do that. Um, let's see, how do other branches check them with the executive branch? Um, the appointment of justices, so that itself is a check. Um, the legislative branch, let's say they don't agree with the Supreme Court ruling, they can make an amendment to the Constitution. Now, uh, that's like sounds easy, but it's really not. Like it's probably will take at least a year, year and a half, if that were even to occur. Um, and yes, Congress can also impeach judges. Presidents can um, choose to ignore what they rule. Um, and good luck to you too, Katie. Okay. So so um, that was exclusive jurisdiction. The last one is going to be concurrent jurisdiction. Um, this is going to be when the state or the federal government can hear the case, um, the state or federal court can hear the case. So basically they can do both. Um, one thing that you'll probably notice is that concurrent power, so same word, that's when the state and the federal government have that power. Okay, types of opinions issue. This is almost kind of common sense. Majority opinion is the court's decision. Um, that's like what actually happens, okay? Minority opinion, um, or it's also called the dissenting opinion. It's when the justices don't agree with the majority opinion. So let's say there was a 6-3 ruling. 
the six judges are probably going to file a majority opinion, and then the three judges are going to file a minority or dissenting opinion and say why they don't agree with the decision. A concurring opinion is, let's say there was that 6-3 decision, and four of them say it was based on Clause A in the Constitution, but two of them think it's based on Clause B. So the four of them are going to file the majority opinion, but the two of them are going to file the concurring opinion because they do agree with the decision, but they agree with the decision for a different reason. Okay, so those are the three types of opinions. Okay. Um, yes, um, we will have another gathering before Monday. There's a five-hour cram on Sunday night, but it's five dollars if you want to come. So that's part of if you have the cram pass. Um, if you have a cram pass, then um, you can go for free because you've already paid for it. But if you do not have a cram pass, then you can pay for just that event for $5. So it's going to be two and a half hours of student-led review, so me and Fatima, and then um, two, and a, two and a half hours of teacher-led review, which is going to be the cram teacher who does the AP Gov stuff. So her name is Ms. Johnston. OK, so quickly, um, with, ju with judicial philosophy, judicial restraint is a conservative approach to deciding cases. Basically, they sit, um, try to lean with exactly what the Constitution says. So leaning towards precedent and what exactly is happening, okay? They try to focus on the framers' initial intent and what they believe the framers want, okay? Uh, so that's judicial restraint. Normally, your Republicans are going to favor, favor judicial restraint. Um, judicial activism is going to be more liberal, so um, your Democrats are going to favor this. Um, and it's basically how contemporary issues, so stuff that's happening right now, current events, have um, changed the way the Constitution should be interpreted. So what they believe is that decisions should be made based on the Constitution in the current state of the country, not the Constitution and what the framers like 200 years ago won. Okay, That's kind of the difference there. Um, the other things, so someone asked about checks on the judicial branch, so that's what this standard is about. Um, all judicial appointments are by the executive branch. All appointments must be confirmed by the legislative um, in order to, like I said before, in order to, um, let's say they don't agree with the Supreme Court decision, a constitutional amendment can be passed. Um, and Congress has the ability to pass legislation that impacts the court's jurisdiction. So they're the ones that deal with, okay, what cases can a court hear? Um, and justices can also be impeached, like someone said in the chat, if they don't act with, quote unquote, good behavior. All right, so the last few standards are pretty short, so bear with me. Um, but they're going to be talking about the bureaucracy. Okay, So it, the bureaucracy, well, first of all, we know the executive branch is a branch that enforces the laws, right? The bureaucracy is a really important part of the government because they're, what, they're the part of the government that is able to actually enforce those laws. So we think of the president as sometimes the only member of the executive branch, but behind, behind the scenes, the bureaucracy is the one that's doing it. So um, you see with the bureaucracy in either, um, well, not really in state governments, but a lot of times you have seen it in like city governments, is the spoil system and patronage, which is basically when a government official gives jobs to people that support them in exchange for like um, just support, so popular support in the elections. This has come to be replaced by civil service exams or merit system, which selects workers based on merit, qualifications, not party loyalty, okay? So that's just kind of a background. But in terms of the parts of the bureaucracy, you have the cabinet, independent regulatory agencies, independent executive agencies, um, and government uh, corporations. Can the Supreme Court declare an amendment unconstitutional? Um, yes. Well, no. Well, the amendment, like an amendment is part of the Constitution. So I don't know really what you mean there but yeah but yeah so like you can see like a amendment might be like reversed where like yeah so prohibition so that's one example where like they said no alcohol and then they said okay never mind you guys can have alcohol right but i don't think like it could be declared unconstitutional technically because it's part of the constitution so you can't declare part of the constitution unconstitutional if that makes sense okay so the parts of the bureaucracy you have in the cabinet um, independent regulatory agencies, independent executive agencies, and government co uh, corporations. Cabinet is going to be the um, department heads, so like Attorney General, um, Secretary of Energy, Secretary of State, etc. 
Okay, um, and like I said before, their loyalty is generally to the department. Independent regulatory agencies, they regulate sectors of the economy, um, and they're led by commissions that are appointed by the president, but they're supposed to be somewhat independent because the president can't really remove the commissioners. So some examples are Federal Reserve, Federal Trade Commission, Federal Communication Commission, um, independent executive agencies, um, they include non-cabinet departments that have like super big budgets and workers. So for example, um, NASA, the CIA, et cetera. And then you have um, government co uh, corporations and they provide services um, that could be provided by the public sector. So it could be public. However, they have much more freedom from the federal government because they could be public, okay? However, they are still regulated by the federal government, just a little bit more freedom. So some examples are the U.S. Postal Service and Amtrak. Okay, so um, I believe the last two standards. Um, 2.13 is going to talk about discretionary and rulemaking authority. So discretionary authority is basically um, saying that, um, let's say a law is passed. Um, now it goes to the executive branch, and it's their job to enforce it, right? Um, Bureaucrats have a lot more experience in their particular field, um, and they have more expertise, right? So it's their job under discretionary authority, like to their discretion, to implement the law in the way Congress wanted it to be. So that's where you sometimes see some checks on the bureaucracy. So some examples of these departments or um, uh, uh, bureaucratic agencies um, taking like their own stand or something like that is going to be um, allowing certain exemptions for immigrants. So let's say that was the Homeland Security Department. The Education Department could cancel or lower student debt. The uh, Securities and Exchange Commission could fine firms because of illegal conduct. So this is things where there's been a law and then they're interpreting that law based on their expertise and how they can enforce it to best meet the recommendations by Congress. Okay, so um, 2.14, I think this is a new standard, is holding the bureaucracy um, accountable. Um, we're going to be talking, we're going to talk about oversight in just a minute. So, oh, never mind, it's on this slide. Okay, so um, congressional oversight is basically when Congress oversees the actions of the bureaucracy. Um, so they make sure laws are enforced the way they want. So one way that Congress can kind of influence this, and I would say Congress realizes that their intentions aren't being carried out, is that they have the power of the purse, right? So Congress can allocate less or more money to an agency to prevent or enhance um, action. So let's say, um, I don't know, I'm going to make up an example. Um, NASA wants to fly to Saturn, okay? But Congress, whatever they did with Congress, let's say Congress passed a law that said um, you can fly to other planets, but they really don't want to want NASA to fly to Saturn, okay? They can say, we're going to take away all your funding so you don't have any money to fly to Saturn, right? Because all of these executive agencies, they depend on Congress for money. So Congress can choose to either give them more money if they support them or less money if they don't support them. So they also have these committee hearings to make sure that their intentions are being satisfied, okay? In terms of how the president can um, hold the bureaucracy accountable, um, they're the ones that appoint all the agency heads. Um, however, they must be confirmed by the Senate, so there's still some kind of check there. Um, the ideology of the president also influences how agencies operate. So um, generally, these agency heads are going to be um, corresponding, or they're going to be of the same political party as the president. Um, can they possibly pass a more specific law? Yes, they could just pass a new law then. But then they would have to go through that same process, like a new law. Okay, so last one is going to be 215, which is policy and the branches of government. So um, thank you for sticking with me this long. And, and um, however, like really the good thing that you did stick with me is that this is probably one of the most confusing topics in AP Gov. Um, and it's possibly something that they could test. So you're going to have iron triangles and issue networks are the two things that we're going to talk about in this standard. So the first thing, this was kind of, I mean, kind of random in terms of where they put it. But the presidential appointment and then legislative confirmation, that's what has checks and balances in terms of um, the bureaucratic agencies. So if you look at, um, like, let's say the attorney general, the president gets to choose who they want to be the attorney general. However, the legislative branch has to approve. So the Senate has to confirm. Okay. In terms of iron triangles and issue networks, your iron triangles are going to demonstrate the relationship between congressional committees, 
the bureaucracy and interest groups. So hopefully you can see um, this triangle right here and kind of make sense of it. But we're going to go into a little bit more detail on the next slide. An issue network sometimes is looked at as really complicated, but really it's just um, a more advanced iron triangle that's not in the shape of like a direct triangle, okay? So it's like an iron triangle, but not a triangle. So let's look a little bit more closely at this specific iron triangle. So this is talking about tobacco legislation or anything to do with tobacco. So let's look at interest groups. So one of the main things that interest groups do is that they lobby. They lobby legislators to try and get um, bills passed that support their interests. So let's say um, this piece of legislation was going to impact the tobacco industry. Um, interest groups that deal with tobacco or maybe they represent tobacco farmers um, they would be trying to um, influence these congressional committees or legislators. So they might give them campaign contributions, um, support, information about the industry. Okay? They could also uh, be influencing the bureaucracy. So let's say a law has already been passed, and now the bureaucracy is the one that's in charge of enforcing it. So they could support uh, for agencies like budget requests. So let's say you have the tobacco division of the Department of Agriculture. So the interest groups could advocate for that specific department to get more money. Uh, they could also provide more information about that industry to those bureaucrats. Okay? On the other hand, when you look at this side of the triangle, um, committees. So there's subcommittees in Congress about agriculture and possibly about um, legislation like this. right? So in terms of interest groups, they're going to be able to pass legislation that deals with the stuff that they want. Okay? They're also going to be able to approve um, higher budget requests. So remember, I said Congress has the power of the purse. So let's say um, Congress, a few members of Congress or the majority of Congress really agree with this tobacco bill, okay? They could approve higher um, amounts of money to be funded or higher funding to the Department of Agriculture or the tobacco division so that um, they could implement whatever's happening, okay? So you see how this is a whole um, set of relationships and how they're able to interact with one another to produce legislation that almost everyone agrees with, okay? Um, in Iron Triangles, how do interest groups affect bureaucracy? So that um, is these two arrows right here. So they're able to provide information about the industry to the bureaucracy. They're able to support, um, they're like able to advocate for more funding. And that kind of goes again with this part with committees. They're all interrelated. Um, are there any more questions? So lobbying is part of iron triangles. Yes. So interest groups, since interest groups are part of iron triangles, um, lobbying is as well. And yes, government is uh, very complex. That's why they made a whole course out of it, I guess. Okay. So, um, but it is interesting. So a lot of this stuff, it once you like, um, I guess, start learning about it, you can see its application in daily life. Okay. So finally, we're going to talk about issue networks. Um, issue networks, as you can see, uh, this diagram really isn't as complicated as the other one, but it does still include the congressional committees, um, the bureaucratic agency, um, and the interest groups. Okay, so it still does include those components of the Iron Triangle, but it also includes some more. So the media's influence. How can media help um, get legislation passed or stop legislation? Le legislation. How can the local government impact this? How can university think tanks, other organizations that have expertise, how can they help? So the issue network really is just providing a bigger network of different groups that can influence legislation or a topic, okay? So um, looking back at unit two at a glance, um, the first few standards we talked about legislative, uh, legislative branch, next few we talked about the executive branch, Last few, we talked about judicial, and then we talked about the bureaucracy. So bureaucracy, remember, fits into the executive branch. However, um, uh, we're just talking about it separately because they have separate standards. Um, all right, remember, on Sunday, there's going to be a five pass. Um, thank you for all the clapping. But um, have a great day, everyone. Um, if you don't have any questions, that's all I have. And yeah, good luck to everyone taking any AP test. I'm sure you guys will all do well. Um, if this is your last stream, um, good luck on the AP Gov exam. Um, I'm sure you guys will all do great.